And before I get started, I just wanted to do a show of hands here too. This is a very controversial topic, as you may know, uh, climate change things. I'm going to hopefully find a nice, interesting middle ground that I think will be appealing to most of you. But just as a quick survey, uh, how many of you would raise your hand if you believe global warming is real and it's caused by people? How many of you do not believe that global warming is real and caused by people? Yeah, okay, good. All right. How many of you don't know and don't really have an opinion? Okay. All right, well, uh, hopefully uh, this will get you thinking and asking interesting questions. It won't be so much um, beating you over the head with uh, you should do this and you should do that, but what I would like to do is raise questions that I think are worth asking. I think I'll take the sides down too. There, how's that? That's not too dark, right? All right, um, I'll explain really soon why I'm using this term climate whiplash, but when you talk about climate change now, it's mostly global warming, but that only is true if you have a sort of a, a short-term view of the future. My background is actually looking at climate history over many thousands of years, like with ice ages coming and going and things. So I'm used to thinking really long term like a geologist would. And so I'm naturally looking ahead on those same time scales, and so are some other scientists. So what I've done is read through some of the brand new research that really isn't that widely known yet about scientists looking into the really deep future. And what you find out is global warming is just the beginning. Most of climate change that we're causing now is going to be global cooling over really long time periods. So uh, this is what people think <laughs> the climate change topic is going to be. Uh, and uh, maybe a third of you are on this, or this side and uh, another third of you are on that side. But it's baloney, uh, hopefully. Uh, I'm going to find a sort of a middle ground here, which most scientists pretty much take. It's, yes, we're all going to die someday, uh, but not from climate change. It can be a very serious problem but it's not going to kill us all. And I'm going to try to make the case for that, which uh, you may or may not believe. For most scientists that are actually in the field of climate change, which there aren't that many of, um, this is all just taken as fact. It's not even a question anymore whether the climate's warming. And in fact, there's an entire uh, way of looking at the world now that a lot of geologists and ecologists have. They call it, there's so much human impact on the world now that it has made an entirely new age of life on Earth, like a geological age, like the age of dinosaurs, age of fishes, age of mammals, and things like that. Scientists are now calling it the age of humans, and of course putting a technical term on it. They call it the Anthropocene, like the Pleistocene and the Holocene and things like that. So um, if, if you go down the list, it really does make sense. We influence every corner of the world, from having wiped out lots of different species to covering the land with farms and cities, communicating as a species instantaneously, electronically, changing mountains and seascapes and coasts. Pollution is pretty much everywhere from pole to pole. And then, of course, the theme of this talk is going to be our greenhouse gases, just the natural emissions we release, are uh, abundant enough that it changes the very climate of the Earth. Um, these are two guys who are actually uh, came up with the term itself. But the concept is now just basically routine. If you go to a, a climate specialist conference or an eco ecology conference, they're just talking about the Anthropocene now that we're in. And it's going to show up in the geological record in the far future as kind of the beginning of that time when humans are the dominant environmental force on the planet. So it's, a, it's a kind of a scary thought, but it's also kind of exciting because we're really the, among the first generations that that's really true. And what we're going to be doing in our lives, lifetimes, is going to have huge impacts far into the future, as I'll show you. So this is sort of the theme right here. When you talk about global warming very much, you may see graphs of temperature going up and carbon dioxide, greenhouse gases going up. But I'll bet you, uh, if you have looked at graphs of this, I'll bet you just about all of them start somewhere 1900 or 2000 year, and then they stop at 2100 AD. They say, if we don't uh, stop global warming by 2100 AD, this such and such will happen. But, you know, that's not the end of time. What's going to happen after 2100 AD? For most people, that's a long view of the future, a century ahead. But for a, a geology type person, that's like, well, something's going to happen afterwards. What is it? That's what the theme of the talk tonight is is what happens next. And a lot of it is really common sense, that you actually don't have to be these experts that I'm going to introduce in a minute. You can just figure this out yourself. Um, the warming can't go on forever. It's being driven by our carbon dioxide emissions. Well, uh, that's coming from burning of fossil fuels. Eventually, we're going to run out sometime. 
So that means our emissions are going to peak at some time. And uh, then they're going to decrease. And so is the carbon dioxide and all the other stuff. So I'm, it's basically what's going to happen first, without even putting time scales on it, is when we start using up the fossil fuels, our amount we're putting in the air will peak and then it will start to drop off. Sometime after that, the amount of CO2 in the air is going to reach a maximum, and then because we're not releasing so much, that's going to start dropping off. The temperature is going to follow that. It's going to hit a high sometime and then start cooling. And uh, through that whole time, of course, it'll be warmer than now, so ice will be melting and sea level will be coming up, but eventually that's going to peak and level off too. So that was this term I think I just had right here, uh, climate whiplash. It was sort of the title of the, the book. It was just this idea that we're so used to thinking of going in one direction, up the warming ramp or up the carbon dioxide ramp, but eventually we're going to have to switch pretty dramatically from adapting to global warming to dealing with global cooling, and it would be kind of like a whiplash effect. So I just figured, yeah, I need a juicy term. Let's call it climate whiplash. Uh, keeping in mind when I say global cooling for a long period of time, it doesn't mean that we're going right into an ice age right away. What it's saying is this little statement over here. It's once we reach as hot as it's going to get sometime after 2100 AD, it's going to be cooling down, but it's still going to be warmer than now for an amazingly long period of time. So if you think about that, it's like this effect on climate we're having is way more interesting, way more scary in a way, way more complicated than a lot of us think about normally when you just think of warming. Like you see a picture like this, there you may have seen uh, photos of uh, over the years of glaciers retreating in mountains, and that's happening all over the world. Most glaciers are retreating like that. And you say, well, there's a sign of global warming because the ice is going away, but if you think about it, uh, global cooling could be pretty scary too. I mean, if you have cooling, glaciers advance. And that can be scary if your town is in the way or your ecosystem's in the way. And it's basically the change itself that really unnerves us. And we're going to have both of them, not just the warming. So how do people come up with this when it's really hard to just predict the weather next week? How do you look this far into the future? Well, it's, again, it's pretty much common sense. And you may need a little specialty to follow it, but I, I think I can do it for you without being too intense here. The basic idea is when you burn oil and gas and coal, the fossil fuels, the fumes go up in the air, and then we kind of act like they go away somewhere. But there's really nowhere to go. It doesn't really vanish from the world. The atoms and the molecules persist. They stay somewhere on the planet. So what you do is you just follow where they go, and that can help you figure out how long the carbon dioxide greenhouse effect is going to stick around. So uh, just as a little like a basic idea of the thing is if you burn coal, let's say, or oil, it's mostly carbon. You get a bunch of oxygen and you heat it up. You combine the oxygens and the carbons and it makes carbon dioxide. So I kept the, the letter C still red so you can see what used to be in the coal. Now it's floating out in the air as CO2 and it builds up in the atmosphere just in that little thin layer up there. And uh, some of the CO2s were there before, and the ones with a little red are the ones we put in. That's going to build up, but it's not going to stay there forever. It's still going to go somewhere. And it's not that difficult to figure it out. It turns out that carbon dioxide dissolves in water, like oxygen does. That's how fish stay alive in the water. They can breathe the oxygen. Same thing with CO2. It goes in. So like there's the carbon dioxide in the air coming down into the oceans in this case, combines with the water and makes a substance called carbonic acid. Let me turn this one on. This pointer is a little better too. Um, yeah, it comes in here, combines with the water, and makes this compound right here. There's that same old carbon that came from the coal. Now it's floating around in the ocean in this solution form. So most of the stuff we're emitting now is going to float around in the air for a while, and then it's going to dissolve in the ocean. And of course, most of the world is covered by ocean. So there's a lot of space there. But there's, unfortunately for us, there's a limit to how much the ocean can take up. Now, I won't show a whole lot of graphs to you, but here's one. This is going to be probably sort of famous in the scientific circles. This is the kind of chart of the future that scientists like this guy, uh, David Archer at University of Chicago, and other scientists like him are now putting out that a lot of other scientists don't even know about. And let me run you through how to read this. This is the long-term picture 
just kind of based on common sense of where the carbon is going to go. This is a timeline. Here's 2000 AD right here. And it goes, this graph goes to 40,000 years in the future. Pretty long time. This uh, axis right here is how much carbon dioxide is in the air. So it doesn't matter what the actual numbers are. I just say, you know, it gets higher and higher as you go up this thing. So this is a graph of how much CO2 is going to be in the air and roughly when it's going to be. And as you can see, we're right about here. We're releasing this stuff. It's going up and up. This is our global warming right now. Well, eventually, we're going to level off and peak, have a little whiplash thing, and then it's going to start to recover as the ocean soaks up the CO2. The problem is the ocean can only hold about three quarters of it. The remaining quarter is going to stick around in the air for a long, 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 long time. And as you can kind of see in here, there's some other things going on. It's basically reacting with rocks on the Earth's crust that will take up the rest. But the interesting thing is this takes tens of thousands of years. And even if we sort of work really hard and reduce our emissions as much as we can in this century, we're going to be facing at least 100,000 years before all of this comes back down to normal and we're back to normal temperatures. In other words, global warming and climate change that we're doing now is way longer a process than most people are even talking about. So uh, just to give you a quick introduction to how that slow drawdown will happen, once it's in the oceans, you've got about a quarter still to deal with. What basically happens is not only does carbon dioxide dissolve in the oceans, it also dissolves in raindrops and things like that too. So normally uh, raindrops are slightly acidic. They have this carbonic acid in them. So the CO2 is drifting around. You get these little raindrops and it goes in and makes a little bit of carbonic acid inside the rain. So rain's always a little bit acidic. And uh, so there's one of those from the coal and here's kind of a normal one. Well, that's going to fall on the ground and hit rocks. And uh, without getting in too much detail, there's several kinds of rocks. Some are like limestone, and they fizz and break down easy. And others are harder, like granite, and they have their own minerals in them. The basic story is when the acidic rain hits limestone or granite, it crumbles it, just little by little, tiny little grains. And it washes into the soil and collects in rivers and goes down to the ocean. So over very slow time periods of erosion, what used to be in the rain is going to have a reaction with the rocks, end up in forms like this, and just wash downstream and end up in the oceans. Well, when all those things get down to the oceans, just for various chemical reasons, it helps them take up even more CO2. So it boosts it. The oceans soak up some more. Now we're cleaning the air up a little more. And on top of that, things that live in the ocean actually take some of that stuff out of the water and make shells out of it. They can make coral out of it and things like that. And it stays on the bottom. So now you really removed it from the air. So those are the kind of processes that I'm talking about is where the CO2 coming out of our tailpipes and our smokestacks is actually going to go. Even the breath you're exhaling right now will end up probably in one of these places in the ocean. But as you could probably imagine, it's going to take a really long time for it to all go away. So um, here's another thing that comes up really quick. Now, most folks think of a long time period as between now and when I let you out of this room in about an hour or the end of the semester. But, uh, you know, like 100,000 years, I mean, a lot of folks assume we're not even going to be around then. So why, why would we even care about this at all? So if you don't mind, I want to do another show of hands here. Uh, if, uh, if you ask yourself this question now, how many would believe that we will not even be around? 100,000 years from now. Got level. Yeah, it's probably a third of you, something like that. How many of you are really sure we're going to be around for 100,000 years? Yeah, so most people, yeah, that's really interesting. Well, let's, let's uh, go into that here. Because if we're not going to be around, who cares if it's going to last a long time after we're gone, right? So let's, let's go into this here. Uh, I think there's four things that could do us in. There's a lot of other stuff, but it just, we're not talking about like bad things, you know. I want things that are going to destroy every last human on the planet so that there are no humans. Okay, I think it's, I think it's these four right here. And uh, let's just go through them, see what they do. Disease, nuclear war, asteroid impact, and death of the sun. All right, well, uh, let's go through it. Okay, the worst uh, disease outbreak on record in history, so far anyway, is the Black Death, bubonic plague. 
It's come back uh, to haunt the world many times. One of the worst outbreaks was in the 14th century, 250 million dead. And that's when the population of the world was way lower than it is now. So to put it another way, um, over here, about half of all Chinese people died. A third of all Europeans, a third of all Middle Easterners, maybe an eighth of all Africans who was mostly in North Africa. It's like horrible. But do you notice, if this is about the worst that it gets, and this is before we had medicine, when you can't, couldn't treat this stuff, they didn't even know what caused it. You could turn this around and say, half of all Chinese survived, two thirds of all Europeans and Middle Easterners survived, and seven eighths of all Africans survived this. Okay, this disease can't wipe out a species normally, at least an abundant one like ours that's adaptable because there are always some individuals with some resistance. So it's a horrible thing to go through, but the resistant folks survive and just repopulate. So disease is not gonna do it. It can be, we can suffer from it, but it's not gonna wipe us out in 100,000 years. Uh, maybe nukes, that, that'd be a bad thought. Let's hope this never happens. But if nukes are gonna do it, it would have to be an all out nuclear total madhouse. Like you can actually find scenarios, like this is actually a map of sort of people planning ahead, oh, what could trigger an all-out nuclear holocaust? Uh, it's like, uh, it comes from the Middle East, and then this country retaliates, and that one accidentally retaliates, and on and on, and make the whole world do it. Otherwise, you don't contaminate the world enough to wipe everybody out. Some people are going to be living in shelters and things like that. It's, uh, let's hope we don't really do the all-out worst possible nuclear war. Okay, that might do it, but uh, probably not too likely, let's hope. Uh, asteroid impact, that wouldn't be fun to be under that. But what if you're on the other side of the planet? Tidal wave. Tidal wave, yep. Um, so anything on this side would be in big trouble, but the other side of the planet, you, you got to have a really big one to do us all in. And you can actually, there are programs online, that we, we have fun with it sometimes in the geology class. We were trying to destroy the Earth with uh, different sizes and speeds of asteroid, and you can calculate. It turns out you need a really big one about that big to kill everything on the planet. And, um, and actually, the solar system has been pretty well mapped for large bodies floating around in it, and we don't have any that big in the solar system. So that's not going to happen. All it is is it might hit your city and you'd be smushed, but the rest of us will be here. <laughs> so the only thing that's definitely going to wipe everything off the planet is when the sun runs its course like stars normally do, it starts to swell up and it's going to engulf the Earth. And then it's going to blow up. And uh, just to show you, like for comparison of how important it is that if anything happens on the sun, that's how big the Earth is, that little dot next to the sun. So this is going to happen. If you ever wonder if the world is, gonna, is coming to an end, yes, but in five billion years. So. No, maybe we won't be around then, but this is not 100,000. So you boil this all down, we are going to be here for 100,000 years, and probably more. You know, we won't, but our descendants will. People will be around. We're going to live through all of this stuff I'm telling you about the long-term climate change. That's the good news. The bad news is we're going to live through it. Somebody is going to have to live with whatever we leave. So let's uh, go on then and uh, look at that. And uh, there are lots of possible things that could happen. Like I said, it's going to be determined by us today. But I just figured, well, let's just take two extreme examples. One is you really switch from the fossil fuels as quick as you can to alternative energy sources, which is a good idea anyway, right? I mean, price of gas is going to go up. We're going to be running out of cheap oil soon. You can have all kinds of unrest till we have other sources of energy. So that's a great idea. Why not do it? If we do that, we'll get a relatively moderate future warming. It's still going to get warm, but not all that bad. So I'm going to call that the moderate scenario right there. We'll switch to alternatives soon, you know. Uh, but if we just ignore it and say, nah, it's too easy to stick with it, we'll burn through all the cheap oil, then we're out of that. Uh, then we're going to switch to coal. And we have lots of coal left that could last another couple hundred years. But if we do, we'll release five times as much CO2, and we'll get a really intense climate future. So I just figure, why don't we take these two extremes and just look at what that would do. So here's the same kind of graph, only now this goes from today for 100,000 years. If we, here's the amount of CO2 that we'd release in the air. And uh, here we are now. 
So let's say we do the moderate one. We go blip just up a little bit from where we are now, maybe 600 parts per million, something like that, which some people would say is not even moderate. And uh, then it will come down here, and then it's going to slowly be absorbed for 100,000 years, and then we're back to normal. If you do the big one, it's going to shoot way up to like, what is it, uh, three times or four times what we are now. And then have a big whiplash and then drop down quick with a big cooling and then go off and it's not even done in 100,000. It's more like a half a million years for it to come back to normal. So let's look at those two scenarios in a little detail. Um, I've got a historical example. Actually, this kind of thing has happened before, each of those. One of them is just before the last ice age, there was a natural warming. It's from the natural cycles of cooling and warming that the Earth does. And uh, you don't have to really read this graph too much, but basically I've got, uh, here's us now with our temperatures right about here, here's the last ice age, and here's that big warming spike. It was even a little, a few degrees warmer than it is now back then. It was like 130,000 years ago. And uh, what was it like in the world when it was a little warmer than now? Well, it's happened. Uh, elephants and hippos migrated north as the climate warmed, and they ended up living in England. If you go to Trafalgar Square in London, you can dig around if they let you without arresting you, and you can get the bones of elephants, saber-toothed tigers, hippos. They were playing around in the Thames River and stuff like that. Animals migrated, and so did plants to go with the climate zones. Uh, people migrated. Uh, they had, uh, modern humans had just evolved in Africa shortly before this. The warming made the deserts wetter. And so people wandered right through the Middle East where it's intense deserts now and migrated. This is the first migrations out of Africa was because of that warming. So it was a time when a, a lot of animals and plants kind of had a good deal going as long as they could move to the habitats they wanted. We uh, did lose a lot of polar ice. Um, scientists who study the ice caps in Greenland and Antarctica can map out how much of it was left during that time. Turns out after uh, more than 10,000 years of intense warming, only uh, at most half of Greenland melted. So that's a lot, but it didn't take all of it. So we could expect maybe partial melting of Greenland and Antarctica. Of course, if you do that, the water ends up in the oceans and sea level starts to go up. So just to sort of estimate, based on that last example, uh, what if we get uh, a fair bit of uh, sea level rise, maybe 20 feet maximum, something like that? Uh, what would that be like? Maybe some of you have seen these kinds of charts. You can find them online now that show you basically a map of the world where the computer then boosts the sea level up a certain amount, and it shows you which parts get covered up. So what we have here is uh, North America, and the red part is what would be covered if sea level came up about 20 feet, 15 or 20 feet. Now, uh, yeah, as you can see, most of the country in North America doesn't get it, but of course, if you live down around here, that's not such good news. One, one misconception a lot of people have, though, in uh, understanding what this really means, it's not so much how high it gets, it's how fast it comes up. And if you've seen movies like this one, did you all see this, Day After Tomorrow? You know, like the waves come crashing in, or Al Gore shows New York City being flooded. It's not going to be that fast. It's a little bit misleading to talk about it like that. It's a real problem, but not for that reason. There's uh, more to it than this. The, the approximate most likely rate, is on average anyway, unless there's a big surge of rice sheets or something, then maybe you triple it still, is about a foot to three feet per century. Now, to put that in perspective, then, uh, that means when you see a map like this of a meter sea level rise and the Florida Keys are gone and the Everglades are getting eaten away, that'll take maybe 150 years, 200 years to happen. So it's not going to be this. A lot of folks are actually scared that sea level of rise is going to kill us. It's not going to kill us, but it is going to eat away at the coastlines. If, in fact, it's already been happening. We've got natural sea level rise happening in the last century, almost a foot already in the last century, and I'll bet you haven't been hearing much about it. So what we expect in the future is kind of the same thing that's already been happening, but faster, to at least twice as fast. So it is a serious thing. It's not going to cover New York City with that much water instantly with everybody holding their breath or like that, Those are, these are not accurate. What is likely to, this will eventually happen, but it could take 600 to 1800 years. 
Uh, depends on where you are. There are maps of the whole world. Check out your favorite place and see uh, which parts get flooded. It's just a simple matter of having a good topographic map to do that. And uh, just go online and look at flood maps or inundation maps under Google, and you can see this stuff happening. What's, what it's more likely to actually feel like is surprisingly, you can already experience now in a lot of big cities around the world, like Venice or New Orleans or Bangkok or Shanghai. A lot of these major cities are already sinking naturally, partly because they're on wet mud, partly because they're pumping groundwater out and other reasons, but they're sinking and there's already water in the streets. I don't know if you're familiar with Venice, but isn't it kind of famous for having the water in the streets? And, People will go there to see it. And it is a pain. It costs a lot of money. If there's anything wrong with your pumps in your basement, let's say, then you're in big trouble. And it is an economic hardship. And yet, it's not considered a disaster either. So it's going to be a, a very important change that this sea level comes up. But it's not necessarily the kind that you might have been fearing that it was going to be. In fact, maybe a few once in a while, it might temporarily even be good for a few places. And I'll show you what I mean by that. Just found this out by accident last week. Uh, this is a map of uh, Amsterdam in the last 2,000 years in Netherlands. And uh, here it was like uh, 2,000 years ago or so. There was a lake here, and Amsterdam was roughly about here, and it was nothing, just a little village. And sea level was coming up naturally and slowly anyway. And eventually, it kind of started to break through into the lake and drain the lake. Now it's an arm of the sea. And then it got bigger and bigger as the sea level comes in. And suddenly, Amsterdam is now a port city, right in time for the giant expansion of the sailing trade and the map making explorations of the world and stuff. They had a boom time because sea level made them accessible easily to the ocean, right there. So now they got this giant thing They used to be landlocked. It basically helped to make Amsterdam what it is. So it's going to be a complicated thing. Any, any cities that are being drowned are going to be in trouble slowly. But the stuff inland is going to look ahead and say, wow, it, it's coming here. We're going to be oceanfront property. Let's start building a port. And then you get this temporary, maybe for a century, this temporary prosperity thing, almost like maybe having the Olympics come to your city for a year, for 100 years. Then you lose it, and the next town in gets the benefits. So it's going to be way more complicated. And some people are going to benefit, and some are going to lose, and it's going to change from decade to decade, century to century. So it's still important, but maybe not the way that we like to think. And you do have to watch out for things like the horrible situation in New Orleans, what is likely to happen. The really dramatic stuff will be when a storm comes in. And of course, you know, maybe the only good thing about the New Orleans thing was we got Ernie Wilson here to join us as a result. Um, so no one would say that's a good thing. But that's where the, most of the dangers are going to be when a big storm shows up, not really from the sea, sea, rise, sea level rise itself. Now, here's the thing I'd like to encourage people to think of is not just about the people. It's a natural thing, of us being people. But as a biologist, too, what about the other species? And I think that's, there's a lot more risk for other species that aren't humans. Like if you are in a coral reef. You like to have just the right water depth. While we're having the warming and the sea levels going up, coral reefs are going to have to struggle to keep up at the right depth. Then when we get the whiplash and the cooling and the falling sea level, they're going to have risks of being exposed. So they're going to have to adapt along the rising and then the falling. Same thing with things like salt marshes are going to have to keep up with the rising or the falling. And it's not clear, depending on what we do, how fast those changes are going to happen. So as a biologist, I would be more worried. So anyway, that was the moderate one. Here's what maybe the worst case would be. The extreme option is we say, ah, just forget it. It's easy. Let's just keep doing our stuff. Let's burn all the coal, too, and then we'll switch, because we'll have to, because we won't have any fossil fuels left. So instead of switching soon, we switch later. So uh, here's basically what would happen then. Here's uh, today. Here's the next just 2,000 years, just looking at that, just the beginning of it. Well, the emissions go up. We run out of, start running out of coal by 2380. We're out of it. OK, now we still got to switch. OK. Uh, CO2 peak will come up, and then it'll drop really slowly. Temperature will go up, and it'll start peaking. It won't even peak for like 1,000 years from now. And when it does, it could be 10 or 16 degrees warmer on average for the whole planet than it is now. 
And uh, sea level rise is going to just keep going up and up because at this high temperature, the ice sheets are going to just keep melting and melting. So this will be long, long, long process. This has happened before, too. If you look deep in the past, not long after the dinosaurs disappeared, we actually had a natural global warming just like that. And what happened? Well, we lost all the ice on the poles. We can study this geologically, and I can tell you about it later if you want. Um, the continents were a little bit covered by more water. This, there was not much ice, so everything was rivers instead of ice and snow. It was washing into the Arctic Ocean, and it turned into a brackish pond. And there was all kinds of wildlife migrating all over the place, because basically every place was warm and lush and wet. There were forests in Antarctica. You can find the tree trunks. It was um, north of Vegas, that's southern beach, I think you call it. Uh, redwoods, ginkgos, palm trees up in the Arctic. So pole to pole was warm. Great if you're an animal, great if you're a plant, as long as you can migrate. That's going to be the big difference between now and then. Yes, we've had a warming like that before. Yes, a lot of critters and plants liked it, but they could move to follow to the habitats they liked. Now, other things besides humans are trapped by farms, cities, roads, and whatever. That's going to be the scary thing for the other species. We will probably be fine for the most part. Even with that, we can adapt and live just about anywhere if we have to, but it's the other species I would be more worried about. If you have the extreme, we'll probably de-ice Antarctica and Greenland. People are actually looking how long that would take and might be surprised to see uh, these, these glaciologists here are calling this a sudden collapse of the Greenland ice sheet. You see how long it takes? 3,000 years would be as fast as it could happen. It's, it's on the order of thousands of years to melt that much ice. So again, it's when, when a geologist says collapse or rapid or anything like that, they mean over centuries, pretty much, if not thousands of years. Still a serious thing. And uh, you'll find out there's winners and losers. Here's Greenland without the ice. This is an actual map. A lot of the center's below sea level, so the ocean's going to come in. There's going to be a fjord in there, like a protected harbor. If you're a Greenlander, you're going to have mining in here. You're going to have agriculture and forestry. You're going to have a sheltered port. You can go out and do the fisheries. It could actually be good for Greenland. There are diamonds and rubies and all kinds of great minerals out here. Let's hope we don't start a nuclear war over who gets to live in Antarctica if this happens. Um, so some places might benefit over the long term, but other places will not. Here's what the world would look like if we lost all the ice. You get about more than 200 feet of sea level rise vertically. Florida is completely gone, and in a lot of Europe is completely gone. So it'll be a mix of winners and losers. The carbon dioxide that will be going into the ocean will acidify the oceans, and that's starting to happen already. And it happened the last time that this warming happened. You can see in the sediments in the middle of the oceans, you go down with regular old gray mud, and suddenly there's this brick red layer from that time period. That's from acid corroding the bottoms of the ocean. So this has happened before. It's not just a fantasy. Um, and it's starting to happen again. So it's a threat to anything that makes shells, from snails and barnacles and clams to coral reefs. That's what we're facing if we do the big one. So these things are starting to happen already. You've probably heard of some of these. What you may not often hear of is that some are going to lose and some are going to gain. How do we decide who, you know, who do we favor here? This is what happens if you lose the ice at the North Pole, which we are doing. You've probably heard about the polar bears being in trouble, also the ringed seals that they eat and stuff like that. They all depend on the ice. But interestingly, as the ice is retreating up there, other stuff's moving in. Harbor seals are coming up from farther south and taking the place of the other seals, as uh, they don't need that sea ice as much to live on. Um, there are whales that are adapted to life under the ice in the Arctic. You notice uh, belugas and narwhals don't have a big fin on their back, which is kind of good if you're bumping up under ice flows. Well, as those are starting to disappear, as the ice is retreating, orcas are starting to move up. And you see they got the big fin there, but it doesn't matter. There's open water, and they, they do just fine. So it's like, well, which do you like better, belugas or orcas? And it's uh, kind of sad because one is going to replace the other because these guys like to eat belugas. So some things are losing, some are winning. 
There are unique ecosystems that only live on the sea ice, including algae and little fish and things that are going to be lost as we lose that ice. At the same time, when you remove the ice, there's more sunlight. It hits the water, makes new algae bloom, and this is already starting to happen. It's being measured. And you start to get lots of other kinds of small fish. Things like cod are moving into the Arctic Ocean. When all the ice is gone, there will be an entirely new open water fishery there. So uh, countries like Russia are already building the fishing fleet in anticipation of that happening. It's a trade-off of winners and losers. People are going to take advantage of this while someone else is going underwater in another place. The Arctic nations, including the rich countries like us and Russia and Canada, are already looking at trade routes opening up over the pole. So there was a, uh, this trail called the Northwest Passage is now a reality. You can sail right through there. The Russians have one also here called the Northern Sea Route. And instead of, uh, this, is, this is showing you if you were in uh, Russia here, normally what you'd have to do is sail all the way through here to reach Europe. And in this way, you just go right over the pole and you're there. So there will be cities, there will be ports, there will be all kinds of trade going on up there, as well as the bad stuff. In fact, people are already starting to fight over it. There's a tiny little uh, half square mile of rock between Greenland and Ellesmere Island called Hans Island. Now, in 2005, the Danes went over there. They claim it because it's near Greenland, but they sort of own, and those Canadians are over here, and they think they own it. So these Danes went over there. They put up a flag. They wrote a little sign saying, welcome to the Danish island, and they put a bottle of snops there at the base of the pole. And then, like a few weeks later, the Canadian gunboat comes over. They knock over the Danish flag. They put up a Canadian flag. They drink all the snops, and I don't think they left anything for the Danes to drink. They threaten like this is an act of war. It's a serious thing. The Russians in 2007 put two submersibles under the North Pole ice, went down two miles to the bottom and planted a flag and have claimed the North Pole as Russian territory. <laughs> so this is real stuff. So here are the facts. What we're doing now is going to affect the future for thousands of years. Some are going to gain, some are going to lose. I think it's important to ask the new questions then with a long-term view. Look at the whole story, not just the worrying. Let's look at everything we're doing here. How do we weigh the good and the bad? And here's something I'd like you to think about. What if some of these changes benefit people way in the future but hurt people now? Which people should we care about the most? Now I'm getting close to wrapping up here. Like uh, here, we're losing the ice. OK, we're losing the, the north uh, floating ice cap now pretty soon. End of this century, end of your lifetime, it'd probably be open in the summer. Then it's going to be like that for probably 100,000 years. And then when we recover from all this, it's going to freeze again. So that's going to reverse. Well, now imagine this. What if there is, by this time, 100,000 years of unique species up there that are used to open water, their entire nations and industries and cultures that develop there over 100,000 years, and then it starts to freeze? How's that going to feel to them? when they kind of wish they could do global warming then to stop the freezing. It's an entirely, it sounds kind of goofy, but it's a serious question. How do we judge? Or here's, a, here's one. Remember, our, our, we're going to keep things warmer than normal for 100,000 years at least. If you look at the normal natural cycles of cooling and warming with ice ages, we're supposed to get, in 50,000 years, we're supposed to get another ice age cooling there. It turns out, because of our CO2, we have made it in 50,000 years from now too warm to have the next ice age. Is that good or bad? Well, <laughs> here's what the world looks like without an ice sheet on it, and that's what it looks like with it. Here's what the last ice age did to Canada. That was a mile or two of ice completely obliterating Canada. So if you, how would you like to live in Canada with that? So it's like. Wait a minute, we've headed that off. Maybe that's good for the people in 50,000 AD, just by driving our Hummers around. Or the next one is due in 130,000 AD. So, you know, how do we choose? If we go and burn all our coal, we'll stop that one too. But then we're going to really hurt stuff nearer in time. So how do we judge what the good thing is? If, if we let another ice age happen, that's what the world's going to look like. So 
It's like, oh my gosh, how do you do this? Okay, well, with a long-term thing, you need to rethink the questions. Maybe there are some win-win strategies, and there's a million ideas, you know, uh, save the earth, save the whales, um, reflect the sunlight away. Uh, how about this one? Here's a, something people are talking about. Is this a good idea? Pump, pump all our CO2 from our factories into the ocean? What's that going to do? It'll acidify everything. That's, a, that's not a good idea. Isn't there anything where everybody benefits? So maybe something like this. Instead of save the whales, why don't you save the carbon? In other words, leave the coal in the ground. Then we just do the moderate thing. We switch to fuels, which we're going to have to anyway, that don't have carbon in them. And then the stuff's still in the ground later when another ice age is coming on. And maybe people want a little global warming to stave off the ice age then. When that's happening, you may wish the, the coal was still around. And that may sound kind of goofy, but it would actually work. It's low tech, doesn't cost anything, really. Um, and people do this accidentally all the time. These are mountains that are on fire. They have coal in them. And the coal seam caught fire, and it's burning. And that's releasing CO2 into the air. There's a mountain in Australia has been burning for the last 6,000 years. All you'd have to do when an ice age was coming was light a few mountains, and you'd hold it off. So maybe, you know, it sounds kind of goofy, but and I, I think I'm, I'm going to wrap up just about here. The good news is humans are going to survive. The bad news is a lot of species may not. And the worse we make this climate change thing, the, the fewer species are going to be here for us when it all recovers. The reality is we are going to decide that future because these changes are going to happen this century in our lifetimes. And we're going to decide one way or another. Either you slow down or you don't. Either way, you're making a decision, and it's going to make one of those two scenarios happen. So what do we do about it? When you got people on one side or the other side yelling at you on the media, remember most of these are not scientists. None of these guys are scientists. Try to educate yourself so you're well informed. Then you can ask good questions yourself. And you can evaluate ideas and solutions as other people come up with them if you don't come up with them yourself. That's really important to just think about this stuff really carefully and know what you're thinking about. You being at Paul Smith's right now is a major contribution to this. And as you evaluate these things, your votes, your money, your words, your lifestyle, anything is just as important as coming up with the solutions. Because if someone comes up with a good idea, it doesn't matter unless other people support it. So just being aware of what's going on and thinking about these things is maybe your way to save your world. So I'll leave you to that. Welcome to the Anthropocene. And welcome to your future Earth. Thank you. Maybe some people have some comments or questions. Isn't the parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere supposed to double in a short period of time? Yeah, it depends on the, it all depends on how much you release. So that's what the big debates are going on now. How do we control our emissions without becoming poor, let's say, or suffering too much? So it all depends on, it, it's us that does that. We may double it, we may hold it steady, or we may triple or, or even more. Can carbon sequestration have an effect on that? Yes, if we end up doing carbon sequestration, which basically means taking it out of the air and putting it in the ground or into the oceans, then you will reduce how much is in the air. The question is, how much does it cost? If it doesn't give you any benefit, it's going to be hard to convince people to do it. They'll say, I don't want to pay taxes now for somebody later who might not know that I did this. So that's what the big debates are about now. Or you could, you know, ideally, if you do it, you're not going to hurt the ocean by acidifying it. Don't squirt it into the ocean, please. And you don't want to squirt it in the ground where it's going to blow up or something either. The best was if it was in coal form. Just leave it in there. It's already sequestered. And then you can use it later for greenhouse gas stuff or heat in your house if you needed to. Somebody else? Yep. Um, we're all doing a lot of things or like a lot of little things to reduce our emissions. Will those show up on a graph? Like on the graphs you're showing, there isn't a little decrease. Will they, will they show up on a graph in the future? It depends on what you're doing. And, uh, you really have to do the math of how much good any individual lifestyle change does and how many people do it. You could cut your emissions way, way low, but if everybody else isn't doing it, it gets canceled out. So it's actually kind of depressing 
when you hear these great ideas we've got, and then somebody, some egghead, unfortunately, does the math and says, all right, well, if we all did that, how much will it reduce? And it's like this much. It's like, oh my gosh. So it's going to take really hard work and ask the serious questions and, and look at the real facts to tell what will really do it. So. When you were talking about an advance in technology, doesn't that have to do with Jarvan's paradox, where you have like one bad technology where it uses a lot of coal, but then you advance it, but since you have more advanced, more people get it, means it emits more uh, pollution, so all the technology equals that one. Was that because of just population, the, the overall problem is population? Exactly, so that your point actually is kind of what the theme was in a way, that it's us and our numbers and our thoughts and our lifestyles that are determining the entire environmental future of the planet. Thank you very much, don't forget open mic.